AP Biology, Mendel and Genetics, Part 2. Our learning goal, once again, is to be able to predict the genotypes and phenotypes in a monohybrid and dihybrid cross. The success criteria is given a genetics problem, determine the frequencies for the offspring's genotype and phenotype. We're going to fast forward to the place where we left off in Part 1. Punnett squares. Today we're going to learn a little bit about Punnett squares. Now Punnett squares are used to predict the possible offspring created in a cross between a male and female. Here we have the male's gametes being made, the male sperm, and then we also have the female's eggs being produced. Now these are the possible eggs and possible sperm made by these two parents. Before we get into Punnett squares, however, we do need to take some notes on how gametes are made. Remember, gametes are made by the process of meiosis. Now in our starting cell for how we make gametes, we're going to have two sets of every chromosome. Remember homologous chromosomes, you get one set from mom, one set from dad, and we basically have two copies of every gene. Here we have one version of a gene called an allele for the recessive trait, represented by little p. Little p represents the allele for white flower color in plants. Big P on the other homologous chromosome is the allele for purple flowers. And as you can see, this plant here, this pea plant, has a purple allele and a white allele. Now since purple is dominant to white, represented by the larger capital letter, the plant will express the purple, but not express the white. The white is kind of hidden. Now when plants make their gametes, they do it within the flower, if it's a flowering plant. For us humans and most animals, we have ovaries and testes in order to make our gametes. Before meiosis, we have to make a copy of the chromosomes. So during interphase, each chromosome consists of one strand of the chromosome. Then during interphase, S phase of interphase, we are, are going to synthesize an extra copy of those chromosomes. During the S phase and G2 of interphase, we now have each chromosome consisting of two sister chromatids. These are still two chromosomes. When we made the sister chromatids, they're just basically a, basically a copy of each other but there's no genetic difference between this sister chromatid and the second sister chromatid that was made, being made by replication. Now we've already talked about meiosis, so we're going to kind of summarize what happens here and try to connect it to genetics. Over here we have our diploid cell, two sets of chromosomes. During meiosis one, we're going to separate out these homologous chromosomes. They're each going to go into a different cell. That's the law of segregation. During meiosis II, the sister chromatids separate out, and we have another round of cell division. At the end of meiosis I and II, we have a total of four cells. Two of the cells, in this example, will have the recessive allele, the little p. So we have two gametes being made, two sex cells being made, both with the recessive allele. We're also going to have two cells being made with the dominant allele. Here we have the dominant allele in one cell, and the dominant allele in another cell. So the possibility of gametes from the parent, that's big P, little p, are either 50%, 2 out of 4, with the recessive allele, and 2 out of 4, or 50%, for the dominant allele. These are the alleles that we're going to put on the side of our Punnett square. The possibility is either big P for the dominant allele, or little p for the recessive alleles. Now this is just one parent. We have to do this for both parents when we're doing a Punnett square. All right, so what do we use Punnett squares for? Punnett squares are used to predict the possible offspring in the cross of a male and female. And remember that plants, as well as animals, and most living things on this planet that are multicellular will have a male and female that can produce gametes that, when they combine together, produce a zygote, which will eventually turn into that organism. Here we have, let's say, the male parts of the flower, represented representing the genotype, big P, little p, that's a diploid cell, and the two possible gametes that can be made are either the dominant allele, packaged up in a sperm, or the recessive allele, represented by little p, also packaged up into a sperm. The female, also a heterozygote, one of each allele, dominant and recessive allele, can make two possible eggs. The one possibility is a 50% chance of producing eggs with the dominant allele, represented by capital P. The other possibility is making eggs that have the recessive allele, represented by a lowercase p. The first step in doing a Punnett square is to put the possible gametes on each side of the Punnett square. 
Typically the male goes on top and the female on the side, but it doesn't really matter which one goes where. Once you have that listed, then we can do our cross. Here for a single trait or a monohybrid cross, we're just going to make a four square Punnett square. If the egg has a dominant allele, represented by capital P, and the sperm has a dominant allele, one possibility is two dominant alleles in the fertilized egg or zygote produced. That would give the genotype of the offspring big P, big P, or homozygous dominant. Another possibility is having a dominant allele packaged up with a recessive allele to make a zygote with a dominant and recessive allele, or a heterozygote, big P, little p. Another possibility is having the dominant allele from the male packaged up with the recessive allele from the female to make an, another fertilized egg, which is big P, little p, which is also the same as the, the, the previous example. And then we have the fourth possibility. We have a recessive allele from the female, a recessive allele from the male, packaged up in the egg, the fertilized egg, to give us a genotype of little p, little p. Now, keep in mind, there's two ways that we can make purple flowers. We can either make purple flowers with big P, big P, or big P, little p. As long as the dominant allele is present, then the dominant trait will be seen as a phenotype. So big P, little p, and big P, big p, all give us purple flowers. For the recessive phenotype, which is white flowers, there's only one genotype to give us that. Since there is no dominant allele, big P, in this plant that's being made, then we can start seeing the recessive phenotype. The recessive phenotype is created only by one genotype, little p, little p. And that's the only way you can get white flowers from this cross. Over here we have the ratio. We have genotype, 25%, or 1 out of 4, which is going to be big P, big P. We have 2 out of 4, 1, 2, big P, little p. 2 out of 4 is 50%, genotype possibility for big P, little p. And then we only have 1 out of 4 being little p, little p. And 1 out of 4 is 25%. That gives us a ratio of 1 big P, big P for every 2 big P, little p for every 1 little p, little p. Now these are just possibilities. Just When you flip a coin five times in a row and it comes up heads, that doesn't mean that the coin remembers that you flipped it heads and you're more likely to flip it tails. It's always 50-50 every time that you flip a coin. Just like when we're figuring out these probabilities for offspring, if we create four seeds and the first three end up being purple flowers, that doesn't mean the next one's going to be a white flower. That just means for every seed, there is a 75% chance of being purple and a 25% chance of being white. That does mean that it is possible to have five white seeds in a row. It's just a 25% chance each time. Here we have the phenotype. Remember that big P, big P, and big P, little p both have the dominant allele, so they'll all be showing a purple flower. That gives us 75%, or 3 out of 4, which is 75%, having the purple phenotype, and then only 1 out of 4, with little p, little p, having the white phenotype. Don't get phenotype and genotype confused. Phenotype is the physical outward appearance of a, a thing. Genotype is a description of the genetic traits represented by letters like big P, little p. At this time, we have some notes on Punnett squares. Here we have page six of your notes, Punnett squares, and we're using that to predict the possible offspring. Here we have two purple flowers. These two purple flowers have the genotype of big P, little p, big P, little p. This one is going to represent the flower that produces the male gametes found in the pollen. That's what the uh, pollen turns into after it lands on the other flower, into uh, two sperm. We'll talk about that in a future class. Here's the bee carrying the pollen, basically taking the male, male gametes from the first flower and transferring it to the female parts of the second flower. The female has the eggs in the carpal and the carpal is just the center part of the flower that stores those eggs, the female gametes. Now our first step is to figure out what gametes are being produced. The male produces either gametes with the big P, the dominant allele, or gametes with the recessive allele, the little p. Here we have the dominant allele possibility for the sperm listed over here, and the recessive allele. Notice I made the recessive allele especially small so I don't confuse it with the big P. All right, we're gonna move this up a little bit. Now the 
female gametes are going to be listed on the side here. The female can only produce the same kind of gametes as the male. We have big P, little p in the diploid cell, undergoes meiosis. So either we're going to make egg with a dominant allele, big P, or eggs with a recessive allele, little p, and that's listed on the side. So these are the two possibilities for gametes from the female, big P or little p, and these are the two gametes for the male, possibly making their big P in the sperm or little p in the sperm. And we can do our cross. We've got big P with big P, making two of the dominant allele. One possibility is homozygous dominant. Then we have big P, little p for, for a heterozygote. Another big P, little p. By convention, we put the dominant allele first. And then the last possibility is crossing this with little p, little p. And um, one possibility is a zygote with one of each of the recessive alleles. And here we have the rest of the notes. Let's go and copy this down. So, what are the chances of making each type of offspring? If four offspring will be made, then will three be purple? Not necessarily. Remember that each offspring has a 75% chance of being purple and a 25% chance of being white. So, even if we had three seeds in a row that were purple, that doesn't guarantee the next seed will be white. It's a 75% chance of making purple seeds every time you produce seeds. The previous event of creating the gametes doesn't affect the future events of creating gametes. Just like when you flip a coin, if you flip a coin five times in a row and it comes up heads, it doesn't mean the next coin toss will be tails. It's still a 50-50 chance. And this is how these punnett squares work as well. It's a possibility of producing offspring. 50%, 75%, 25%. It's not a guarantee. Here we have the phenotype ratios. We have a 75% chance of producing purple flowers and a 25% chance of producing white flowers, or three purple flowers for every one white flower. Pause at this time if you need to finish taking these notes. Here we have some more examples of different crosses with a monohybrid cross or just one trait analyzed at a time. Here we have two parents. One is big P, big P, or homozygous dominant. The other parent is big P, little p, or a heterozygote. They're both going to appear purple. The first thing that you want to do is write down your alleles. That way you don't forget. And if you don't write these down, then it's kind of hard to figure out what you're going to be looking for as far as analyzing traits. Here we have the purple flower allele, represented by capital letter P, big P. And we have the white flower allele, represented by the lowercase letter P. And then the gametes produced from one parent, big P or big P. Not a lot of variety in the sex cells being made here, the gametes. It's either going to be a dominant allele packaged up in a gamete or a dominant allele packaged up in a gamete. Then for the second parent, we can make one of each allele in our gametes. We have big P, little p, so we write it on our big P for one possibility in the gametes, little p for the second possibility in the gametes. Then you cross it. Big P, big P, big P, big P, big P, little p, big P, little p. Now when you analyze this, you see that 100% are going to have the purple phenotype or physical appearance. The reason why is because every one of the possibilities has the dominant allele, big P. You can take a look at it just a starting point and kind of tell that's what's going to happen. As you can see here, we have a dominant allele, dominant allele, and remember the offspring are going to get one of those two alleles in the, the fertilized egg, the zygote. So you know that the offspring is going to get at least one dominant allele and as a result, they're all going to be at least purple because they got that big P. We can also analyze the genotypes as well. The heterozygotes, which would be big P, little p, one of each allele, that's two out of the four, or 50% chance of making big P, little p in this cross. The other possibility is big P, big P, that's two out of four, so there's a 50% chance of having big P, big P, uh, or the homozygous dominant genotype. Let's do the second example. Let's go ahead and try to do this uh, cross at the bottom. Big R, little r, cross with little r, little r. Basically a round P heterozygote with a homozygous recessive for wrinkled peas. Pause at this time, and then you'll see the answer. All right, here comes the answer. So we have two big R little R's, two little R little R's, giving us 50% round phenotype, 50% wrinkled phenotype, 
and uh, this ends part two of your genetics notes.